Tonight, the world's most daring athletes drop out of the sky, plunge down waterfalls and leap off cliffs. For the next half hour, tomorrow's world goes extreme. The race to be the fastest human on the planet, the heart-stopping new sport of speed skydiving. Plus, flying like a bird, the new wingsuit that lets you live your dream of soaring through the sky. And why do they do it? Have you got the right stuff to be an extreme athlete? Much of the growth of extreme sport over the last decade is due to the development of new equipment and technology. And one new device that many of these skydivers are now wearing opens up new opportunities because it measures for the first time the speed at which they're dropping. It's led to the extraordinary new sport of speed skydiving, never seen before at the festival. Skydivers have always done pretty amazing things, but surprisingly, one thing they've never been able to do is measure how fast they're going. Planes measure their speed in various ways. They have pitons like this, which suck in the air and then measure the airspeed. Many planes also have radar that measure their ground speed. Now, obviously, skydivers couldn't carry kit as cumbersome as this. They need something small so it can fit on the body. And they need something that can continue to measure speed even as the skydiver tumbles about doing maneuvers. And this is it, a tiny computerized speedometer. It also logs many other details of the skydive, including the altitude. Niels Bruskard is one of the inventors. He heads two miles up so he can leap out and demonstrate it for us. In this dive, Niels is deliberately varying his speed, falling faster and more slowly in turn. Just like an altimeter, the device measures changes in barometric pressure to calculate its height. It also has a clock, a microchip, and software to work out the speed. My exit altitude at 12,700 feet. I was falling for 57 seconds. Mm -hmm. My average speed, 100. 23 uh, miles per hour, maximum was 130 miles per hour. Even more information can be displayed by docking the device with a computer, and a video of the dive can actually be synchronized with the graph. 100%. Ah, and there we have a, a, a picture of the yes. profile of your flight on the computer. That's amazing. So the beginning of the flight on the left, the end of the flight on the right, and the descending line there right the way across the picture of your height at any point of the flight. And that red line, that's your speed? Yes, yes. And the detail there is, is quite remarkable, isn't it? With such a powerful tool at their fingertips, skydivers soon came up with a new, even more extreme sport. And the object is as simple as it is scary. To fall as fast as possible, in the process becoming the fastest human on Earth. There are few rules. No weights or artificial aerodynamic aids are allowed. Just head toward the ground and reach the highest possible speed over one vertical kilometer. But it is extreme. You've got to be real careful about what happens when you're coming out of 300 mile an hour speed. You've got to make sure that you sort of bleed that speed off correctly, otherwise you could hurt yourself. Going faster than uh, most other humans can even really re relate to. It's kind of in, in, impossible for other people to, to think about speeds uh, up at uh, 300 miles per hour. But you're constantly moving your fingers and your feet just to keep that vertical position. Just little tweaks all the time. It's like, woo, woo, woo. And when you pull out of it, it's phenomenal. The G-forces and the speed you're going at, it's fantastic. This is normal skydiving. For years, people thought the skydivers fell at a maximum speed of around 120 miles an hour. The wind force against the body prevents it falling faster, 
but if you give the wind less body to push against, you can greatly increase the terminal velocity. Ken Hansen is one of the originators of the sport. I know that around maybe 220, 230 miles per hour, there is a, a zone there where it, it feels very hard to get through it, like almost like a sound barrier or something like that. That's the hard part because at these speeds, it's so easy to, to get uh, thrown out of the, um, of the line. To become a speed skydiver, the first thing you have to learn is how to fall head down, which isn't simple. Here, the skydiver is trying to learn how to balance on her head whilst falling vertically. You can see how the wind constantly tries to throw her off balance. The world record is 330 miles per hour. That's the, the record. 330 miles an hour? Yeah. That's amazing. So how quickly are you falling a mile? It's uh, a mile is uh, done in about 12 seconds. These skydivers are pioneers in a little known world. They say the air feels almost like concrete at that speed. And it seems a kind of shockwave develops around the body, leaving the skydiver in a pocket of relatively calm air. The dive lasts just over 30 seconds, and the top speed is held for just 15 before they have to slow down to safely open their parachute. The speed skydivers get ready for the festival competition. As the plane climbs to 13,000 feet, the competitors focus and prepare themselves. Anything loose has to be secured. Even helmet visors are sealed with tape. As right now, this is indicating a maximum speed of 250 mile an hour, and uh, seems like my average speed is around about 238. But it's still calibrating that right now; it's calculating that. So we have to go and hook that up to a computer and check that out. 256 miles an hour. If I'd have had that judo, maybe two thirds of the way, I think I'd have been much quicker. The maximum speed was 262, but it's uh, the competition is over one kilometer. So I have to check on the computer to see the exact the average speed I had. Ken's average is 242 miles an hour, making him the fastest human at the festival. The first World Championships of speed skydiving take place this year, made possible by the new computerised speedometer. If you want to see more of those amazing images, go to the Tomorrow's World website at www.bbc.co.uk slash tw. Most of the sports at Extreme Week are unbelievably scary. It goes without saying that you shouldn't, of course, try any of these activities yourself, unless you're an expert. But you've got to wonder, just what is it that drives someone to become an extreme athlete? There's no doubt it takes a special kind of person to put themselves through this. Or to attempt this. You're quite afraid, and you're joyful too, so it's a, it's a strange mix of uh, feelings. It's just the feeling of going from zero to 100 kilometers in like three seconds. It's good. I think it's the thrill, the feeling of being alive. It's like being with nature. I think I'm sort of that type that likes excitement. It's always nice to just face your own fear. Then you do it, and afterwards you're just so happy and so relieved. It's a great feeling. We need this strap. Gunnar Breivik has been studying extreme athletes over many years. He's found that only one in ten people are cut out for high-risk activities. They're known as high sensation seekers. They seem to love strong sensations and stimulations since they were small kids they probably love to climb high in the trees and to go fast with a bicycle and be active and run around according to psychologists there are four main characteristics that define the personalities of sensation seekers they all like to seek thrill and adventure they love new experiences they're easily bored and they're very uninhibited. Mo 
whilst extreme athletes are not reckless, they're often quite obsessive about safety. The festival only allows highly experienced parachutists to jump off cliffs. But why do they keep coming back for more? Recent studies suggest their brains may actually function differently to most people's, with heightened pleasure centres that react well to stress and danger. Gunnar is going to test for us the stress levels of several athletes at the festival. He'll monitor base jumpers to see how high their heart rates get when they leap off the mountain. They'd also have a psychological test to reveal their state of mind. He's also doing the same tests on extreme kayakers. They're going to attempt this frightening waterfall which no one has ever kayaked down before. So you're about to go, how are you feeling? Um, quite relaxed actually. Quite nice feeling. I feel like I've got that little thing in my stomach that keeps me where I am now. I've got it. I'm not even going <laughs> and my heart's racing. Well, good luck. Thank you. See you at the bottom. Yep, for sure. David is the first kayaker to go. He makes it, and then it's Marianne's turn. Safely down too. So, how high were their heart rates? Several minutes before going down the waterfall, David and Marianne are already quite tense, with heart rates of over 100 beats per minute, well above the normal resting rate of 60 to 80. As they approach the drop, their rates start to climb, with Marianne's higher than David's. The stress and sheer physical effort cause her rate to reach 181 by the end, close to her maximum, but still a little below what a less experienced athlete might reach. So let's see how that compares with the base jumpers. As they complete their pre-jump test, I can't even bear to get close to the edge. It's 3,000 feet to the valley below. So you two, how are you feeling now, though, as you leave? Just psyched up, focused. Yeah. Okay, well, have a good jump now. Relax. Like, have a good know, jump. Thank you. Focused way. We will. Uh, we'll see you at the bottom. Yeah. See ya. See you then. Dag will leap first, followed by Richard. They'll have only 10 seconds to get far enough away from the cliff to open their parachutes. Three, two, one, see ya. Both get down safely, but how did they bear up under the pressure? Once again, minutes before the jump, Richard and Dag already have heart rates of over 100 beats per minute. As they prepare to leap, Dag starts to climb well above Richard's. Though the physical effort isn't as great as kayaking, Dag's still reaches 178 by parachute opening. Like Marion's, it's at the high end of the extreme athlete's range. The psychological tests confirm that compared to the average population, all four athletes are high sensation seekers. They're also, as expected, much lower than average in fear and anxiety, though base jumper Dag is relatively high. Dag has a lot of negative feelings. He is much more frightened yes. uh, before the jump. He didn't seem like that when we no, talked No, he didn't. <laughs> he probably solved this problem by being playful. And he has obviously found his uh, mental techniques to deal with this. In fact, none of the athletes tested are super cool characters. Each allows their heart rate to get quite high, and research is suggesting this could actually help them perform better. Although my instinct would be that it'd be good to have a terribly low heart rate going into a thing like this, mm. so I'd, I'd be calm and collected, yeah. you're saying it's natural to have a fairly high, it's good to have a quite a high heart rate. Yes, and, and it is a bit surprising. High sensation seekers, they have higher heart rates when they enter these situations. Of nervous energy. Because they are energetic, they have positive moods, they are prepared, they, they really go for it. An intriguing result, which Gunnar is researching further. But one thing's for sure, extreme sports are certainly not for the faint-hearted and certainly something that none but the most experienced should ever dream of attempting.
Wherever you turn at the Voss Extreme Sports Week, it seems someone's doing something crazy. It's reckoned that in the last decade, ten times as many people have taken up extreme activities, partly as a reaction to society getting ever safer and more controlled. Whilst increasing numbers of people want to experience the thrill of the extreme, expensive equipment and training can put many sports way out of reach. But there is one activity that's open to all, if you've got the guts. Top skateboarders show off their latest moves. And there's new equipment on show too. This revolutionary new board is being tested at the festival for the very first time. We showed you a prototype last year on Tomorrow's World and now we can show it in action. Six wheels and unlike other boards, it can slide or carve a turn just like a snowboard. It was invented by Californians who wanted to enjoy the sensation of snowboarding but without the cold. Boarders at the festival are eager to try the new board. You ride on these wheels here, they're movable like this, so you're able to drift and slide. And, um, With the freewheeling centre wheels and the outboard wheels acting like the edge, it should feel just like snowboarding. Good luck. Thanks. <laughs> and it's a big thumbs up from the snowboarders. Before you know it, they're experiencing the thrill of the piste down the local lane. Nearby, at the end of the main Voss Lake, kayakers are taking part in water sport's newest competition. They call it rodeo kayaking. The sport relies on a radical change to traditional kayak design. Until recently, kayak holes have always looked like this. The bottom is rounded like these boats have always been, right from when a canoe was just a hollowed out log. But now they look like this. The bottom is flat with sharp edges where it joins the sides. It may look simple, but the design allows kayakers to do things in the water they couldn't even dream of a few years ago. This boat works on the principle of sliding. It's actually on top of the water, on the surface, like um, like a skimming stone. And the reason it works is uh, the water is going to move across the hull like this. And when it gets to this edge, instead of it sucking up the side of the boat, it carries on straight past here. I can get my kayak to surf a wave on the river, just like a surfboard surfs on the ocean. So I go down the wave pointing one direction, and on the way down, I'll spin into a back surf. So I'm pointing backwards. You can do a 360, so you go down the wave and you spin the whole way round. Sticking the, the thin ends of the boat in the water and rotating around the middle. So the thing is cartwheeling. That's what it's called, a cartwheel. And the boat will go end over end over end. The event is judged on compulsory moves and style and it's victory for Britain's Alan Allard in Extreme Week's first rodeo competition. Now, a new chapter in the story of human flight. Last year in Tomorrow's World, we brought you these remarkable pictures of Britain's top skydiver, Adrian Nicholas, wearing one of the first wingsuits ever made. This is a one-off specially made for him. But now a new design is causing a sensation. It's the first mass-produced wingsuit. It means that now anybody can fly like a bird, provided, of course, they're already a very experienced skydiver. Yari Kwasma is a man with a vision. Ready, set, fly. A vision that all humans can fly. What drives me to this 
it's just the beauty of flight. It's the, the beauty of freedom. Once you get out from the plane and you, and you fly, you really feel that you are completely free from all the worries what you have in the world. For two minutes, you are completely free. And I decided that this should be available for everybody. And we took a goal to develop the wingsuit that would be easy and safe to fly for every reasonably experienced skydiver. Throughout history, many have died in the quest for human flight. In the 20th century alone, around 70 so-called birdmen lost their lives. But Yari believes the technology now makes unassisted flight a reality for all. Annalise Norman has wanted to try the wingsuit for some time. As she's an experienced skydiver, Yari has agreed to make her one of his pupils at the festival. It's very natural. Just you think, you look, and you think, and, and just a small moment, and it make, make you carve there. The principle of the wingsuit is that the three webbed areas combine with the body to form one large wing shape. Like a plane wing, the body then gets its lift in two ways. Firstly, flying at an angle to the direction of travel creates lift from the force of the air. But this also slows down the flyer, so designers try to maximize the second effect. The curve of the wing makes air rush faster over the top, and this lowers the pressure above, resulting in lift. Should be my arms in the same level of my body, or like a little lower? Actually, what you have it right now, it, it looks very good. Mm -hmm. Yari's wingsuit is much easier to use than earlier designs. It needs far less strength in the arms to fly, and the parachute opening has been made more reliable. In the first wingsuits, there was always a danger of the chute getting twisted by turbulence just behind the body. And there are other new safety features too. The suit itself has the, the reserve system, so that if you would have any problem, you could use the reserve system and actually free your arms from the suit itself. So, so your arms at the moment, of course, are very constrained. You, you exactly. can't put them above your head, can you? That's right. Normally, you would be using the main the zipper, but if that wouldn't work, you can also use the cutaway system, like Annalisa has with the, the loops, and she just simply grabs them and, and places his hands up. Oh, that's amazing. There, which cuts the way the wings at the same time. Annalise, has he taught you all you need to know now? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so sure. you're quite confident? Yeah, I feel very comfortable. I think I know everything to do. I can't wait to go and try everything. <laughs> it's taken less than an hour's tuition to brief Annalise for her very first wingsuit flight. She'll have Yari close to her for the entire jump. They'll be soaring for around two and a half minutes, compared with just a minute in the air for a free fall. They'll cover several miles, so the route has to be planned carefully to navigate back to the landing area. At 12,000 feet, a standby to jump. The whole flight will be filmed by Yari's partner, Robert Pechnik. Annalise is buffeted around a bit as she gets her balance, but in just a few seconds, she's able to soar away at speeds of up to 100 miles an hour. How was it? Great. Really? Great. I love it. Can't wait to do it again. No problems? <laughs> no problems at all. What it's is the difference great. about flying with this bird suit? Oh, it's a long free fall and oh, it's, it's like an airplane. Yeah, Yanni, how was she? Oh, she was like a rocket up. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> with her, her body and these wings, she took off and I thought that, okay, is that Antonio flying there? No, that was Annalise. <laughs> Having learned the basics, Annalise joins in a spectacular festival event. Yari is hoping to form a human flock of bird men and women, with up to eight people flying in formation in their wingsuits. As each will be flying at around 100 miles an hour, it'll take great discipline and organization. How challenging is this flock flight going to be? Uh, this one can be very, very challenging. So uh, let's see what will happen. But I think that we have very good people here, and they will do their good job. To give themselves the maximum time to form the flock, they go higher than normal to 15,000 feet. Ready, set, go! Right. 
but they immediately hit trouble, flying into huge rain clouds. With no visibility, forming a flock is out of the question. Ready, set, fly! It's the very last afternoon before they finally get a window in the weather. One by one, they come together. Till at last, five people succeed in forming a human flock. Annalise is among them. Suddenly, a problem. One of the flyers collides with Yari. They plummet from the sky, but each manages to open his chute and return to Earth safely. Yes! Yes! <laughs> yes! It's a fitting end to a remarkable festival. Finally! Wow. <laughs> That's it. Time for us to say goodbye from the mountains of Norway. We hope you've enjoyed our journey into the extreme. And it brings us to the end of another series of Tomorrow's World. So have a great summer and we'll see you in the autumn. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>